Hey Akronites, welcome once again to Around Akron with Blue Green. Now on this episode, I meet up with a few amazing musicians and we talk all about the bands that they front in Akron. I also go down to the Akron Children's Museum and see what that place is all about. And I had the privilege of meeting with a few of the members of the Akron Vulcans. Now to kick this show off, I'm going to go down to the center and talk to Hayden Gilbert of Hayden Gilbert and the Ruckus. Let's go see what Hayden's all about. Hayden Gilbert and the Ruckus. Um, it consists of myself as a singer-songwriter, guitarist, and vocalist. Uh, we have Ben Gravat, who is uh, Roxy, who's the, the drummer. Um, John Bontempo, who is bass. And sometimes we also have John Chaplin, who's on saxophone. And we make we like to say like it's the kind of music that there's like a primal element to it. It goes to your soul, but it's all just, we just like to have fun. And you can tell that we like to have fun and that gets other people into the group. There is such talent in this city. I mean, in any kind of genre, there's there's jazz and and funk and soul, metal, um, blues, rock. I I'm amazed when I walk down I live in Highland Square and like walking through there and so many places that you can play or downtown Akron, so many different different spots. I do think though that there's like there's some cool support. I go to uh, open mics when I can uh, and um, it's so great to see all these different artists from all these different walks of life um, different like, from your beginner to you've been touring all over uh, and everyone can be in one room and just play standards or experiment with their original stuff I've had stuff that I was just just rough drafts, and I've been like, ah, oh, yeah, maybe I'll work on this, or oh no, I don't think I'm gonna get up and you know, people are really supportive. Oh come on, you love that song, you know, like do it, you got it. And so I think that that really helps uh, people break out of their shell. So I like how much community there is actually in the, the music scene in Akron. There are so many places to play over here, and so many places that might be uh, kind of off the beaten path that you wouldn't expect. There's like you know the flower shop. Uh, there's a uh, there's the vintage the vintage go over here, and that's it's like an antique shop, you know, thrift antique store. It's so cool, and I love that Akron doesn't just have you know your regular venues. You don't just have your your music, uh, you know, um, but now you have just these little like, stores are willing to support. House shows, there's the DIY scene in Akron is so on point, it's so good. And if there isn't a venue that is available, people will, it's apartment, a house, they want to make something happen, they want to hear the music, so they'll even put something together in a place that you'd never, never expect. So I think that's really cool. Baby, yo, my sugar high. Oh, that groove, that flow, that, mm, it's like you're able to forget everything. You're flying, man. You're you're flying. It's um, it's hard to explain. You're you're just in it. In my case, with the the guitar and singing, my fingers. I'm not even thinking about it. They're just going up and down the fretboard. They're doing what they need to do. The voice is doing what it needs to do. And I guess really, I'm not forgetting everything. I'm really. A lot of my songs uh, are stories, 
you know? And so I try to remember back to what that story was about. Some of them have characters. I'm putting myself in those characters, those positions. And so that helps. Going back with the, the theater, how has theater really uh, helped me in performance, the music and in general? Getting into, it's still me, but within these circumstances that I have written, and so I'm able, when I get into that groove, I'm in that place, I'm that character, I'm within those circumstances. And that's when you can, instead of playing, you're living. I'm living. There's a difference when you, when you can tell that artist is letting go. Be edited all at once too, but you can tell when someone's letting go and they're just flowing and because that's when you get those goosebumps and you're in it. That's, love that, live for that feeling, live for that. Next up, I'm going to head down to the Akron Children's Museum and talk to Tracy Buckner and see what the Akron Children's Museum is all about. We're excited to be a part of the arts and culture scene here in Summit County. Uh, we've got counterparts, you know, other uh, or other organizations across the county um, that are not necessarily geared specifically toward children. If you have a child that's maybe birthed to like 10 years old, this is the place that, you know, kids can come, have a good time, and everything is designed specifically for them. Additionally, our memberships are so reasonable. They start at just $55, and if you have membership across the country to other children's museums, we reciprocate those memberships. So when people come, we've actually had people come from about 44 different states across the country, 57 counties here just in Ohio, and, uh, and like I mentioned, over 135,000 visitors. So we've got museum reciprocation. So uh, you can show your museum pass if it's at a certain level, and you can have entrance into our museum. So it's, it's wonderful that we can be a part of the arts and culture scene uh, and just geared specifically toward children. been here in downtown Akron for a little over two and a half years. We opened our doors November of 2016 and since then we've had over 135,000 visitors. Uh, the museum came to be because the founders, uh, Betsy and Ryan Hartshoe, they travel across the country when they're on vacation and they'd be able to, uh, you know, take the kids to different children's museums and they were wondering why there was not a place like this back home. So they got a couple of their friends together and they really just spent years trying to figure out uh, whether this was feasible for the city of Akron, whether it was something that families would want. And uh, after all of their research and trying to find a location, they figured that yes, families would like to have a place like this. It's just a fun place for kids to explore and to learn, have a good time, uh, come here with their grandparents when just for a fun outing or, you know, with their school on a field trip uh, or just with parents or even for special events that the museum has. So the museum's uh, thriving and we're just excited that families are attracted to uh, a place where children can let loose and be themselves and imagine who they could be uh, years from now in the Little Monsters doctor office or the Little Vet Clinic or in Grammy's Kitchen. We might be building the next chef, you know, and we've even got a style studio and they might become the next top model here in America. The kids that we see here are all different types and you know we're a museum for all people and uh, we're inclusive and so some of the kids that we see they might be taking a tumble in our canal quarter and they're at the water table and they're all wet but they don't mind one bit because they're having a great time. Uh, in our curtain call theater we've got an opportunity for children to dress up as an astronaut, as a firewoman, all different things that they can imagine themselves being. 
And then in our exhibits like the Little Monsters Doctor Office or the Little Vet Clinic, they take the animals out of the cages. There's all sorts of tools. They put on their vet jacket and they start working on those animals like they really know what they're doing. But it's really just uh, a prediction of what we're going to see here in the future. These little people are gonna grow up to be the actual physicians, the actual actresses, the actual engineers who can create and make and invent. So we see children of all different shapes, and sizes and ethnicities, and we love it. We have a really uh, wonderful opportunity for families that are visiting from other places to get here to Lock 3, which is where the museum is located. But we're actually under the parking deck on State Street. And despite all of the uh, growth that's happening in the city right now, we have convenient parking. You just park in the deck, hop on the elevator, come on down, walk across the breezeway, and you're here at the museum. Parking is just $2, but it is actually free for the first two hours. So we know we've done our job when we see kids kicking and screaming after they've left, and um, sometimes they make it within those two hours, sometimes they're here a little bit longer, uh, but parking's convenient, and we're just excited to be able to be so conveniently located here in central downtown Akron. Akron is a great place to raise kids. I grew up in, uh, in Cleveland Heights and came here because I married 21 years ago. And we really decided on making Akron our home because we just feel like it's a great place to raise a family. It's uh, got very affordable entertainment options, whether it's restaurants, whether it's you know museums and different cultural experiences that we can have. So it's, um, it makes me feel uh, my heart is warmed because I know that I'm in a place that my kids can thrive and grow, they can get a good education, and they can also have a great cultural experience that will create memories to last a lifetime. Next up is a historical segment. Did you know there was a football team in Akron called the Akron Vulcans? I sit down with Bob Meeker and Fred Gissendanner of the Akron Vulcans. Well, now there was some publicity that the Vulcans were coming to town, and I think I got contacted. There was a, a, a man named Ben Barber who was kind of the recruiter, and he brought me in to see uh, uh, Frank Kern and Lou Remkes and, and the rest of the staff. But I figured, what a way to go to law school, make three fifty a week and pay for my law school. So I decided to sign, and it was, it was easy to do. I just was married just prior to that. Being from Kent State, and um, my senior year was 65, and a lot of people in the Akron area still knew me, and um, I was uh, approached by joining the Akron Vulcans, and so uh, I decided to, you know, to do so since um, I didn't get drafted, or, uh, and I was still eager to play football at that time. I, I would equate it to the minor leagues, to double A AA or triple A in baseball. And uh, they were trying to serve. They, the Continental League, I think, is still in existence. And if you look at the, uh, the teams that, where they played, uh, we played the Orlando Panthers, who were the defending champion. Wheeling had a team. Charleston, West Virginia had a team. Uh, the Toronto Rifles, the Norfolk Neptones, they, they were all in, in big cities around the country, around the eastern part of the United States. And uh, we went and played at many of those places, and we had them in here. The Orlando Panthers, it was an exhibition game. That was our first game here, and we uh, had 14,000 people in the bowl. To this day, I still meet people who bought season tickets and they want to tell me that they, they still have their Vulcan season tickets that they never got to use, of course. And I had watched real carefully when all the articles were in the paper that Frank Hearn uh, supposedly was a uh, brilliant uh, evaluator of, 
of large hills to determine if they had sand and gravel and other things that, that uh, made them valuable. And he owned 75 pieces of large earth moving equipment and that he was a very wealthy owner. So that was fine with us as long as we were going to get the little bit of money that we were getting at the time, which meant a lot to all of us. Well, then when the checks start coming in and then bouncing, there always was another excuse along the way. One I remember is I, I mentioned the Toronto franchise. The Toronto Rifles was about to fold. And so Frank Curtin, uh, as, as Paglio and I had a meeting with him to say, well, what happened here? Why aren't these checks good? Well, we had to send a bunch of money up to Toronto to save that franchise. Whenever I received uh, my check, <clears throat> I got word that, uh, uh, that uh, some of the checks had bounced. So what I did, I went to the bank. In fact, uh, there's a copy of uh, the check that I had actually torn the, uh, the receipt off of the check to cash the, the check and uh, the banks uh, wouldn't cash it. Well, uh, all the coaches quit except Lou Remkes, the line coach. And so into town comes Sal Rosen, league commissioner, Brooklyn, New York. And Sal Rosen was about 5'3 by 5'3. And uh, Wheeling had sold out their stadium for that Sunday, and we were going down to play the Wheeling Ironmen. They had a long history of being in the Continental League team. So myself and the defensive captain, uh, Paglio, negotiated with Sal Rosen, and we negotiated $200 a man in cash prior to the game. Which, which doesn't sound like much to, uh, at this day and age, but back then, a lot of the teammates couldn't eat because they didn't have any money for anything or to stay and so forth. So on Saturday afternoon, we got in a bus and the team went down to Wheeling, West Virginia to a hotel. And we looked around, looked around, no Sal Rosen. Sunday morning, pregame meal, no Sal Rosen. We went out to the stadium and we got dressed. We went out, warmed up, and we came in and we said, that's it, we're not going out there. By this time, the stadium's packed. So Lou Remkes goes across the field and has a confrontation with Saul Rosen in front of the Wheeling ownership. And uh, they supposedly were gonna square off on each other. The Wheeling ownership intervened and they came in the locker room and counted out per man $200 in fives and tens and twenties. And my memory is that we lost the game 28-27 although the record here shows that it might have been 21. But I remember 28, 27, and that was it. That was the last hurrah of the Vulcans. Frank Kern eventually goes to prison. And, and it's funny, they convicted him of defrauding an innkeeper. And that had to do with having, having all the coaches and a bunch of the players at that hotel up on State Road. And the idea would be that, that he never intended to pay him and there was no opportunity to pay him, and he never did pay him. And um, that, that's what he spent some time for. What I really liked about it is a bunch of the guys that I played with and against in high school were on the team. Fred Gissendinger, Rodney Dingle from East, Mike Buckner from East, um, Clay Hill, who was from Howard High School, and a bunch of other Jack Kringle, who was from St. V. It, it was a good feeling. Um, like uh, Bob said, that you got a chance to play with uh, teammates that you, know, that you played against you know, in high school. Um, and you got a chance to meet some of the players that you heard about, but uh, never got a chance to, you know, to play against. Now to wrap this show up, I'm gonna head over to the center and talk to Jerry Sapronetti all about Time Cat. This is an amazing band, and you gotta see what Jerry and Time Cat's all about. At first, we were just a two-piece, so it was just me and a drummer. And then after a few years, we just kinda like, we kinda like, it's been sort of an organic thing. Instead of just trying to force it, like, oh, we need all these different players and stuff, we just kinda let it do what it's going to. So then um, we met our bass player, and that, we just kind of like worked immediately. 
the first time we jammed, we were like, yes. So it was like the three piece. And then recently, in the last couple months, we started jamming with uh, our bass player's good friend. On, uh, so he's playing second guitar, and it's really just like filled it out. And it's been like really organic. It, there hasn't even been a conversation like, so like, are you in the band? It's like we're just playing. It's like, well, yeah, there's a show this night. Okay. It's just, I don't know. It's pretty casual. What about you? we're crazy I think we're kind of crazy I feel like it's kind of like unhinged like it can be just like madness you know it's like depending on our moods even or like what kind of tequila or whatever it's like I don't know I think it's I think it's pretty like um, we've got like a lot of diverse a lot of diverse songs it's not like we're just going out there like you know, da -da 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 constantly or anything. Like I try to write like all kinds of different songs. Like I get really, really bored really fast with that stuff. And uh, but I feel like if someone walked in, I don't know. You you should probably like rock and roll because you're probably gonna not like it. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like old school, psychedelic, super loud. So if you don't like loud music, it's gonna be hard for you. <laughs> Vision can change. What is a dream? Like, what is a dream? I don't know. It's like look up Merriam-Webster. Look up the the, def the true definition of it. It's like, I mean, you wake up from dreams, but a vision, like, like you can actually like bring that into reality. Like you can. It's like you get an idea and then you love it and you go after it because for some reason it's like. The vision envisioned you too, you know? It's like, to be cheesy, it's like, that's, it's, to me, that's like the truth. Like, why would you have that vision? Why does it come to you? You know, it's not like I play the different kind of music or I'm a different, totally different person. I would have had a different, uh, like, thing that I followed. You know, it's like everybody's following their own vision. And the more focused you have it and the more you love it, the more you're gonna be led to something that's super awesome instead of something that's super regular and boring. Because who needs, who needs the boring, same old, same old thing? Unless that's your thing, it's like, go ahead, but. That ain't me, boss. <laughs> you can take your job. <laughs> She's we come from like, you know, these people that have been like farmers. They've been like hard working, like, you know, the salt of the earth kind of thing. And there's n like, that's an amazing thing. But with the way society is now, I feel like um, you don't necessarily have to do that. Like people can make money off of YouTube. You know, we don't, we're not an agrarian society. Like we're, most of us aren't battling somewhere in some distant land, you know. Things are way different than they were. Everybody, you know, you'd have to be crazy not to realize that. But something I was thinking about earlier, actually, uh, about happiness, um, there's this John Lennon quote where his teacher apparently asked him when he was a kid, like, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he says, happy. And she's like, I don't think you understand this assignment. And he's like, I don't think you understand life. And you can just imagine, like, little seven-year-old John Lennon with his little glasses on, like, I don't think you understand life, man. Like, just being all, like, kind of like angry towards his teacher, but I agree with that, man. It makes so much sense. It's like, and I don't, it's not like follow your bliss and like wear rose colored glasses and ignore all the things that are bad. It's not like that at all. It's just like, it's like you have to live your life, not somebody else's definition of what your life is because otherwise you'll never be happy. You're always gonna be living in like the shadow of like society's expectations. It's like you'll never ever, <laughs> you'll never ever be happy, I don't think. You'll go home and watch Netflix and imagine about a cool life far away, but it's all just a, a child's dream, you know? It's like, you don't, you don't have to give in, you know? You don't have to give in. And that's, I just feel like it's all about your mentality, so. I mean, happiness is something you work for, not just like, 
uh, you just get it on, on a check from whatever crappy job you have. Unless you like being an accountant, because I don't think I would. <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. The world needs doctors and stuff, but, you know, your dream is your dream, bro. What can I do about it? Thank you once again for watching this episode of Around Akron with Blue Green. Now, if you have any questions or comments, you can reach me on the web at www.aroundakronwithbluegreen.com or you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you once again and have an amazing day. Baby, you're my sugar high.